Hi, thanks, Erin, and thank you everyone else for coming. I'm really grateful to the Bibliographical Society of America for allowing me to speak. Um, this is a tool that I use a ton in my research. I think it's really great, so I'm really happy to share it with you. So, hopefully, all right, there we go. <laughs> Change the slide. So, what is Awesome Table? Awesome Table is a free web application that transforms spreadsheet data so that it's easier to search, sort, filter, and share your data. And this data can be text, it can be numbers, hyperlinks, and even pictures. It creates something kind of like a database, except you don't actually have to know how to program it, uh, which is good for those of us who are not coders or programmers. It works with data both in Microsoft Excel and in Google Sheets. Today we'll be talking about Google Sheets exclusively since that's what I've used it with before and the Microsoft Excel uh, capability is pretty recent. They have the same, Awesome Table has the same sharing capabilities as Google Sheets and Docs, but you can share it with just yourself, you can share it with a specific group, or it can be completely public. So for example, I, since I've used it to disseminate my own research, most of mine are public on Google sites. But for example, when I was a student assistant at the special collections at William and Mary, we used it just among the staff to keep track of older and newer shelf marks and their locations in the stacks when we renumbered all of our manuscript collections, which they had been using in a spreadsheet and were complaining about the functionality of that. So this made everything a lot easier for them. So we're gonna go through a couple of examples from my research so you can get an idea of the possibilities for an awesome table. So this spreadsheet here is a, where the data for a corpus of 35 private library inventories containing a total of 2,963 books. The transcription information and the metadata I created for it spreads across 38 columns and 2,963 rows. Now this is not exactly easy to search through or filter. Um, and so what I've done is I've created this awesome table and there's a GIF of me using the filters there. Um, and this is fancier than what I'm gonna, going to show you how to do today um, because it uses a template to create this list of entries here on the side that then you can click on and change the information. Um, but you can see my, my mouse moving around here in the GIF, narrowing the results to all folio-sized books in Latin written by Aquinas. Um, so typing Aquinas there and then doing this for books that were owned by people who died after 1625 and then the format in folio and narrowing it down to four books. So this is another format that uses a template. Um, it's a map. It shows where 35 owners were spread around the map with filters on the side here to narrow the results. And users can click on the pins here to get more information about the uh, owner. But then also there's hyperlinks here and then here, uh, which then lead to sites that have more bibliographical information and a transcription of their private library inventories. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. This is a very simple awesome table, just two columns. Um, we can, with this, the user can search different authors here through this text box, but also they can filter how many cases uh, the author or libraries rather, the author appears in. So you could slide this up to five and you could see all of the authors that appear in at least five libraries. So in order to demonstrate how Awesome Table works, I'm going to be using some real data uh, that I have on armorial bindings from the library of Joaquin Gomez de la Cortina, who was the Marques de Morante, and he was a 19th century Spanish bibliophile. And so within this, I have 50 rows of data, one for each book that I've examined or found out about. And the, data, the metadata on it spreads across 25 columns. And so we have information like what library it's held in, the shelf mark, the title, author, publication information, and the style of the coat of arms. And so out of that, we're gonna look at how we create this awesome table here. We can now filter by 13 different metrics, and we can also sort the entries by any of these columns by just clicking on them. So it'll sort either A to Z or from least to most if it is a numerical value. 
you can see here we've incorporated pictures of the bindings, but then there's also hyperlinks here that a person could click on and then they would be taken to the virtual international authority file for this particular printer to get more information. So the first step in the process is to enter the data into a Google Sheet. And you can do this one of three ways. You can either upload the Excel sheet into Google Drive and then it converts it into a Google Sheet. You can copy and paste the data into a new Google Sheet from Excel or you can start in the Google Sheet originally and just enter your data that way. I tend to copy and paste or I start in Google Sheets in the first place just because uploading and converting can often take quite a while. But you can see here, this is in Google Drive where the file upload is, and then it would be on the bottom right hand corner of your screen to say, create new spreadsheet. So then the next step is we want to establish our header row and our filter row. And so the header row is your first row in your sheet. And this is, each of the columns should describe what sort of, what the information is inside of it. I think most people know it's good practice in a spreadsheet to have headings for your data. So in this case, I have the, for a British library, Senate House and Lilly Library, I have the holding institution, we have the shelf mark here. This would be um, a link for the digitized copy. And so what the header row is going to be transformed into is the titles for each of your filters. So if we were to go back to here, this, the information that's in your header row is what shows up here and also shows up in these filters. The second thing that you need to do is you need to insert a row directly below the header row. And this is what is going to turn into your filter row. This is uh, where you're going to type what kind of filter you want to be applied to your data and also keywords that say how you want your data displayed. And it's really important to remember that the filter row has to be in the second row and visible, so you can't hide the row in order for the awesome table to work. To work. So you need to be really careful when you're filtering, filtering or sorting inside the spreadsheet itself if you needed to manipulate the data inside the Google Sheet. Um, if I'm going to sort a row, or a column rather, I always hide the filter row, I do what I need to do with sorting, and then I unhide the filter row when I'm finished. If you forget to unhide the filter row, this is what it looks like. And this is not what you want. Um, you can see it's sort of interpreting the, sec the second row of just data as something else. So it says holding institution, British library. So the third step is to add our filters and keywords. And so we're gonna go through the filters that are available to you and some of the keywords. So the first set of three filters are string filter, the number range filter, and the date filter. So the string filter is a string, shirt, string search. It searches the text within a column. So you can see here, I've typed in Brocard under printer. So now it's coming up with Arnaud Guillén de Brocard and Juan de Brocard. So this isn't case sensitive. So I have a lowercase b here and it's uppercase in um, the data displaying, but you have to remember that it is accent sensitive. So if you have grave or acute accents, if you have the NA, if you work in Spanish like I do, those, if you include those in the data itself, the user has to type them in here in order for the person to show up. What I've done in practice is I do include the NA, but I don't include the accents just because I figure most people might know to put the NEA in versus they probably don't necessarily know where the accent is. The next filter is the number range filter. It creates a slider for filtering numerical values and that's what I've used here with publication year. And so it takes all of the dates in the column and it figures out which one is the earliest and puts that at one end and which one is the latest and puts that at the other end. And you can move, the person using your awesome table or you can move the sliders around to bound the range. Now the date filter also uses numerical data, but it is for filtering dates. And it works fine. The, my only caveat with that is that if you are just using the year, it's better to use the number range filter because the date filter wants a day, month, year format. And so if you were to use the date filter on this information here, this would show up as January 1st, 1487, and this would show up as December 31st, 1855. And we don't have generally have that much accuracy for uh, publication information, but 
if you wanted to use the date filter, try and make sure that your data is, has the full day, month, year format. So then the next three uh, filters all create drop down menus of the values that are in the column. And so first we have a category filter, which just takes the values and puts them in the drop down. And the logic that it uses for it is or. So that means if a user selects multiple values, then what shows up in your results only has to match one of those. Um, but then we have these other two filters here, which I think are really cool, are the um, CSV filter and and CSV filter or. And so this is really useful for comma separated values that you have in a single cell. So what I normally use it for is genre because in a lot of early modern books, they cross genres. So you might have a book that is about both religion and law and so in the cell for that book under genre, I write religion comma law. But then when I want to share my data, I don't want it to show up in this drop down here as religion, law, and then religion comma law, because that's kind of clunky. I want the, when I hit religion for religion and then any books that include religion and something else to show up. And so that's what we want to use our CSV filter and in CSV filter or. So they both work with comma separated values. The only difference is that CSV filter and uses and as its logic. So that means if you select multiple values, it, um, what shows up in the results has to match all of those values versus CSV filter or uses the same logic as category filter and whatever the results show up only have to match one of the values that you've selected. So you can see here, this is the category filter for format. And so I've selected Octavo, which has narrowed, narrowed our 50 results down to 22. And then in this case, for the information on the style of the armorial binding, I have a CSV filter or, and I've selected both ciphers and type C. And because it's or, it only has to match one of the two. So that gives us a result of just type C and then another result that's type A, but it also includes ciphers. If this filter was CSV and, all of these results would have to be type C comma ciphers in order for it to work. So here we can see me selecting Octavo, and so it's now filtered to just Octavo. And then I'm gonna select ciphers and then type C as well. And then we'll scroll over and you can see all of the results there. So there's another th interesting thing that you can do with those drop down filters called dependency filtering. And what this lets you do is it lets you restrict the values shown based on what you've chosen in another column. And you can only use this with category filter and the two CSV filters. And so how this works is you take uh, one column. And then in both of the columns, so, so I normally use it with country and city or other geographical things because I want the user to be able to select a country and then only see cities that are in that country so that a user can't say select France, but then they select Madrid as the city and then they end up with no results because Madrid is in Spain, not France. So what I wanna do is I want to put um, to bound what cities show up when I choose the country. And in order for this to work, all of the columns involved must have the same filter. So a category filter can restrict another category filter, but not a CSV filter. So what we see here is I have my cities in one column and I have my countries in another column. And I've put category filter for both. In the column that I want to use to restrict another, I'm gonna put a parentheses. And then within that parentheses, I'm gonna put the letter of the column that I want to restrict. So in this case, I want to restrict city, which is column N, so I'm gonna put N in parentheses. So here is a screenshot of the dropdown for city without any country selected. And so we see several different cities. We see German, German cities, Switzerland, and um, Dutch, and then Spain, all together because I haven't chosen a country. But when we look in this uh, screenshot here, I've chosen Spain, and now all of the cities that show up are Spanish. 
So again, this is a good way to sort of foolproof some choices so that your users don't end up with uh, a no results coming up. So then another thing that you can choose to put into your, uh, into your filter row are something called keywords. And what these do is they determine how your, uh, how your data renders. And so there are 57 different keywords um, I'm only going to talk about three here, but there are other ones and there's documentation on the Awesome Table website to show you how to use them. So the first one is called hidden. It hides the column in the Awesome Table, but the column is still present in the data. So this is useful if you have information that is useful to you, but the rest of the public doesn't need. So this might be private research notes on a particular book that it's useful for you to uh, keep that with the rest of your data, but not everyone else needs to know about that. The second one is a hyperlink type and it renders as a hyperlink, which is very useful for doing linked data. And so this screenshot here shows how that might work. Now what I could have done is I could have just written hyperlink type here and then all of these links would show up in the spreadsheet. But I wanted it to be a little bit fancier. So what I've done is I've added this other row here and I've put printer info in. And by typing hyperlink in this column and then in parentheses putting M, which is the column where the hyperlink is located, this will render as looking like a hyperlink in blue and underlined. And when a person clicks on printer info, it will take them to this site here. And the other thing to remember for that is that this has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence, um, which is why I've also created this extra column because I wasn't able to find information on all of these printers. If you have a blank space in the column where the links are, but you have information here, this, when it renders, won't show up at all because it's sort of applying a blank space to it and so it doesn't want to show up. So that's why I often create these extra columns. The other keyword that we're going to talk about is image type and this renders an image um, into, your sh into your table from an image URL. So I've used that here. Um, this is a link to an image from the British Library for the binding for this particular book. And so all I've done is I've typed image type and it will render for us perfectly. But the other thing that this demonstrates is that keywords can be combined with uh, filters and other keywords. So in this case, I've combined it with the hyperlink type. And so what that means is that not only do I have a picture that's showing up, that picture is turned into a hyperlink. So I've put the hyperlink type into the same cell as the picture. And the way you combine is you separate them with a space on either side of a hyphen. And then in the next column over, I have the link that I want users to be taken to when I click on the picture. And by putting the letter of the column where the hyperlink is into the parentheses where the hyperlink type where I want the users to click in order to be taken to the hyperlink, now that's all connected. And so we see here, so there's the picture and I'm going to click on it and it's going to take us to the BL database of book bindings. I'm going to go back and click on one of these printer info links and then that should take us to the VIAF for Adrian Gamart. So there we go. So now we're going to put it all together and we're going to connect our Google Sheet to our, um, to our awesome table. So. Let me get out of my PowerPoint for a sec. And so here's our data. And I've filled in some of these hyperlinks here, or some of these filters in here, but I wanted to go through filling them in um, with you all so you could see what happens. So this first one here is for a digitized copy. And so like the printer info, I've created this extra column so that people can click on words for that say digitized copy instead of seeing the Google, the Google Books giant URL. So in order to connect this, I'm going to put in the hyperlink keyword, I can spell, hyperlink type, and then in parentheses, I'm going to put where the link is. So in this case, it's in column D. So I'm going to type D and I'm going to close my parentheses. So now for title, since this is a whole long piece of text, I want to be able to search that text. So I'm going to say string filter. 
And then if we come over more here, so here we have the publication city and the publication country. And we had said that we wanted to use uh, dependency filters on that. So I'm gonna put the same type of filter. I'm gonna use a category filter for both. But then in the column that I want to do the restricting, I'm going to open a parentheses and then I'm gonna put the letter of the column that I want to be restricted by this column. In this case, I want to use country to restrict city. So I'm going to put the column letter of city in, which is N. And then we have publication year here. And since it's numerical data and it's not a full date, so date range doesn't really work as well. Uh, we're gonna say number range filter. And then for our Morial cipher, because we have these, some of the cells have just one value in them, but some of them have comma separated values. We're gonna do a CSV filter and I'm gonna do a CSV filter or, cause I want it to just be a one or more things applied to my results. And then I'm gonna come over here so these are all different notes that I have of copy of specific information. And I wanna keep that, excuse me, with this data set, um, but I don't need the rest of the public to necessarily know this. So in this case, I'm gonna put hidden in. So now that we've got all of our filters, it's time to connect the spreadsheet to awesome table. So we're gonna to go to awesometable.com. So awesometable-com. And it looks a lot like, um, Google Docs or Google Sheets. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna click on the plus sign to create a new app. And we're gonna say, select a spreadsheet. And because this is through my Google account, it has already connected all of my sheets in here. So all I have to do is click on our Morante bindings sheet. As you can see, that's the title of the sheet up here. And I'm gonna hit select. So now what we have to do is we need to select the sheet where the data is. And I know it's in sheet one. And it automatically predicts where the range of the data is. So it thinks it's in column A to column Y, but I'm gonna just check that. So here's Y at the end, and here's A at the beginning. So we're good on that. And then I'm just gonna hit create. It'll load, and it'll, so here we have all of our data here. We have these filters, you can play around see here's Spain, bound that to there, I'm gonna say the ciphers. And so you can get rid of these one by one, or also if you click on the dots here, you can clear all the filters at once. So on the right hand side here, we have our settings for the spreadsheet. This first one shows us our source, Morante binding. It shows us the sheet where the data is, which we could change, and also the range. And it's good to remember that if you add or subtract columns to your sheet, you're gonna to wanna to update this range. Sometimes if something looks wonky here, check and make sure that your range is correct on the data. And also in the, um, any of these filters that have parentheses and are referencing other, uh, other columns, make sure that those are correct as well because sometimes when you add, uh, when you add a column, this gets thrown off. So then we have the app configuration. And so we have the visualization type. This is the table. This is the basic one. This is the one I generally use. There are other one, all of these other ones you can use. Some of them do require templates though. But one that doesn't requ require templates is charts, which creates um, pie charts. It also creates word clouds, which I think are kind of cool. Um, so that's some really easy graphics with zero work. We can see that Romana is very common in the titles, which makes sense because our bibliophile really liked Latin. So I'm gonna change back to table. And the other things that you can change within table are the number of items displayed and also the layout of where the filters are in relation to the chart. So I'm gonna say five, and then I'm gonna put the filters on the left and hit update app. And so we can see these are all on the left now. I liked to make the number of items displayed be sort of as, as many as appear on one screen, because unfortunately this scroll bar here is only at the bottom. It's not at the top where I at least normally put my filters. And so they're gonna think, 
oh, it just cuts off at printer here versus be seeing all of this data on the side. So now we have some additional formatting um, things you can do. This is allows you to change what sort of text is inside these drop down menus. So if you put choose one here, this would say have holding institution over the top, and then it would say um, choose, choose one in the middle. And then you can change the background color. This is either with hexadecimal or you can say type in something in particular. So I'm going to type in blue and I'll hit update app in a second. You can also change the date format. So this is day, month, year. And so you could change it to month, day, year if you wanted to be American. Um, but I'm going to hit update app and it's going to turn a really ugly blue color like that. And then I'm going to write in transparent again and bring it back. And so then the last thing that you can edit is this is where if you wanted to add a template and if you go into the documentation for awesome table um, and I'll have a link on the last slide of where that is. Um, this is where you would select the sheet and it has to be within the same whole spreadsheet. So I would probably name sheet two template to easily recognize it. And then you select the range of the cells where your template is. You can add a Google Analytics, Analytics tracking code. And then the last thing that you can do is you can choose whether users can download the data in the awesome table as a comma separated value file. And this is a really nice, easy way to allow your data to be available to the public or other users without having to send your original spreadsheet to them, especially since they can download a filtered or basically customized version of the data. Um, the only issue with that is when I've tested it the last couple of days, it hasn't really been working that well. Um, so that is a thing for Awesome Table to troubleshoot. So now that we've gone through all of that, it's finally time to talk about sharing and publishing. You can simply share a link to the awesome table so that others can view and um, not do any edits or anything. And we do that by clicking on the little people with the plus sign. And so this is the link if you wanted to give it to someone for them to be able to edit. And then we also have one for them to be able to view. And um, one thing to remember with that is that the Google Sheet itself has to be accessible to anyone with the link, which if you go into share here, and it should load. So I have it as anyone on the internet with this link can view, and you could change that if you wanted. Um, just to go back to the awesome table, your other option um, is you can publish that, and you can embed it in a website. So you can do this through a direct link, you can do it through an iframe, or a script. I usually use Google Sites, um, so this is, I use the direct link, but they have a link here for more documentation about that. So now I'm gonna go to Google Sites, and I have, you could start a new site here by clicking the plus sign, but I already have one up, for, up and ready for us, as it were. And it's loading. And so what we want to do here, so we have this blank space, which I forgot to, it's already there. So I'm going to delete this. So what we're going to do is we're in the insert tab and we're going to hit embed. And so it wants a URL. So I'm going to go back to here. I'm going to copy this, insert it. And it shows up and you have to adjust the width. And I just do it as far as it'll go, and then it'll adjust as necessary. And you can also, with Google Sites, you can, you can determine um, how, how much you want to share or not share. So I'm gonna hit Publish. And hit Publish again. And it should be live. And so it's already here, but you can see it's gonna show up on the side here and we can use these arrows to go through as necessary and the other thing to remember is that all of this updates live and so if i made a change in my spreadsheet it would change in the awesome table here and it would update in this and whatever changes you make to the settings will also show up live pretty much live it takes a couple of seconds or so 
So I could change in the app configuration that I want the filters on the top again. And so I'm gonna say update app. And so the, now they're here. And now I'm gonna refresh this page. And they're on the top. So that is pretty much it. I'm gonna go back here. Are there any questions? This is the link to the forum. This is the link for documentation. Um, this is my contact information. I am very happy to help anyone that has questions after this. I mean, it's going to be on YouTube, um, but I find the documentation really good. They update the app regularly, so it's not like this is going to go obsolete anytime soon. So thanks so much. I'm going to stop sharing so that um, we can do the Q&A and you can talk to me face to face for it. Okay, um, let's see, Q&A. Are the values in hidden columns findable at all in the awesome table? Um, so you can do a thing where you can combine hidden with a filter. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again so I can demonstrate how that works. Um, do, do, do. And so I'm gonna go over here to this hidden bit and I'm going to do hidden dash string filter. So I'm combining a keyword here with a filter and then I'm gonna let it save, figure itself out. And I'm gonna come over to our awesome table here and here's the refresh button for that. And so you'll see that column doesn't show up, but now I can do a string string search on that column and it will still um, it will still restrict the values based on that. So I'm going to type in the, which apparently I used the four times. So that's how that works. All right. Now I'm gonna stop share again and I'll go back to the QA. Um have I found any file size limitations in terms of the number of lines or columns? Definitely not the number of columns because like that Bibliothecas Novatos one is um, like 38 columns, something like that. I mean, it's 2,900 lines. It takes a second to load. And I have a note on my websites that says, uh, if it takes a second to load, like it's a lot of data, just, just chill. But um, it's not that. I, I think it works pretty well. I've never had that much of a problem um, with any sort of file size limitations. I haven't tried it on 10,000 things, but it, serve, it does perfectly fine with 3,000. Um, the next question is, do you have any best practice recommendations in general, things to remember to do? Um, the biggest one for me is to remember to keep your filter uh, visible and in the second row and when you are sorting your table if and I, I don't mean here I mean here if I wanted to do sort A to Z on this what I um here sorry I'm trying to share my screen I'm trying to talk by sharing my screen so now if I wanted to sort A to Z on this column what I would do first is I would unclick this CSV or so that it didn't show up and hit OK. So now that row is hidden and I can sort Z to A. And then when I'm done messing around, I'm going to re-click CSV or so that it comes out. Um, the other thing to remember is with the links that if you don't have a link, and you're trying to connect it, make text in another column hyperlink, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Because if you have text in the text column, but there's no hyperlink, um, then it doesn't work. Then it's just gonna show up as a blank space. Okay, and the next question, are the templates you mentioned free? Are they hard to use? Can you make your own templates to save and use for other projects? They are free. Um, I don't think they're super hard to use. I uh come from the sesame street code uh school of coding as my mom likes to call it where uh, one of these things look looks a lot like the other i can show you in one of my 
one of the research ones. Um, let's do combined master. And they, it take, once you get the hang of it, it's very easy. Um, but it, I don't, I don't think they're, they're unmanageable for ever, for anyone. And if you have a little bit of CSS knowledge, then you're golden. Um, so there's a lot of tabs in this. So I believe templates are over at the edge here. So yeah, so I have my template here. Um, this is a big spreadsheet <laughs> with lots of tabs. So yeah, so you can see here, um, this is controlling what shows up um, in the first box for, so this is what shows up in the title of the sidebar. And then we have, um, this is the information that shows up on the right-hand side. This is very cool. This is the general, my general search. So I have a lot of different columns put together um, and in one general thing. And that I don't think actually, I mean, you have to have it in a template, but basically just in double curly brackets, you put all of the different headings that you want to be searched together. And then you have one row in the data here um, that, just says general search and string filter. And then because I'm using the sidebar hidden and then you can sort of combine text searches in one column. So I don't think it's that hard. I definitely think it's manageable, especially since they have um, a lot of different uh, documentation on how to do that. Um, do people using my awesome table need to have a Google account to view the data as an end user? No, they don't. Um, so, and yeah, they don't, they don't need to do that, especially if you publish it on a website, because then it's just there. Do I need to have a Google account to use Awesome Table? I believe you do. I think it may also work with Microsoft accounts now because of the Microsoft function. Um, yeah, the Microsoft Excel function. Well, Any? thank you, Alex. I think we're at 12, 340 now, so that is our time today. Um, if there are no other questions, we could take one. Oh, here's one more. This will there be the go. last one. Can you start using it without adding the filters as you learn? Yes, you can. Um, so if you just have, um, you can add a blank row just beneath the header and connect it all. And then it just sort of shows up as a slightly more nicely formatted table. And then you can, um, you can add the filters, you can experiment, you can do whatever. I mean, that honestly, that's what I generally do is I, I have kind of a rough idea of what I want, um, how I want the data to look, what I want the filters to look like, but I definitely adjust as I go. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think the learning curve is too, too high. Well, thank you so much, Alex. I really enjoyed this presentation. This is something that I am really excited to start using in my own work um, when I start cataloging my own private collection. Yeah, no, this is a really good thing for that. Yeah. Um, so I thank you again, and I thank everybody for joining us and just remind you about the community subtitling project and the links that you can find in the chat. Um, and I look forward to seeing you about at BSA events coming up in the future. Thanks again, Alex, and see everyone soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.